In this tutorial we're going to show you how to create a lithophane. Lithophanes date back several hundred years when they were either first moulded or handcrafted in porcelain and other translucent materials. A lithophane image is what we cut into materials like corian and certain plastics that can only be seen clearly when backlit with a light source. It works by varying the height of the image so that in the dark areas there's more material than there are in the light areas. Ultimately when it's backlit the grayscale image can be seen through it so this is what we're actually aiming for on the screen at the moment, but to walk you through how to create it, let's go up to File and Close. So let's come up to Create a New File, and let's go for a single-sided job, and it's going to be width of 8 inches, height of 10 inches, thickness of 0.25 inches, units are of course inches, Z0 position off the material surface, XY dating position in the middle, uh, and we will actually change it to the bottom left for toolpathing later, but just something to keep a note of, middle for designing, bottom left for toolpathing, just keep that in mind. Modeling resolution set to very high because we're working with a model here and we're going to go for a material setting of a solid color. So we're going to use this color here in the bottom right here called gray 25%. With that, I'm going to click OK so we can get started on lithophane. So now we need to look at importing a bitmap. We can do this in two ways. We've got the tool here to import a bitmap. We've also got this tool here to create a component from selected or imported bitmap. Now, this one is actually great because it allows us to use uh, a lot of detail so it's actually great to use when working with bitmaps that you need to get a lot of detail out of such as lithophane because this will allow us to get the maximum amount of detail that we can from our imported bitmap so let's go ahead and import our uh, image so here we've got the charlie chaplin one and if we double click on that to bring it in it brings it in the top right there for us so to make things a little bit easier to view let's go to our tiled views here so let's click on arrange views vertically and you can see here in the 3D view, it's actually brought this in in the top right-hand corner because it's respected our uh, XY dating position of the middle. So it's brought in from the middle and up from there. And you can see if I tilt the view by right mouse clicking and moving it around, it's actually created a 3D component from that bitmap as the tool specifies here to create a component from that selected or imported bitmap. Now, I want to bring this into the center of my job space. A couple ways I can do this. I can click F9 on the keyboard, or I can come up to the tool here for Align Selected Objects. I can simply click on this one here to align it to the middle of our worksheet. And I want to look at sizing this up a little bit because it's quite small for our sheet currently. So let's click on our model. You can click on the option here to set selected object size on the transform objects. And we're going to have the scale selection, job align box, uh, we're going to make sure the anchor is in the middle and I'm going to change the Y value here but you'll notice I've got the uh, XY link checked because I want the X value to change in proportion to my Y so I've gone for 8.5 and I've also got all the scale Z on let's hit apply and that looks much more appropriate for our worksheet so let's close that out now if you look at our 3D view here and we kind of move it around and zoom in you can already see there's something's wrong here you can see that actually some of the lighter areas like on Charlie's face and around him are actually raised and the darker areas are actually lowered. But in order for a lithophane to really work, we need the light areas to be the lowest areas and the dark areas to be higher. So we need the highest points um, to be the dark areas and the lowest points to be the light areas. And that's because we're going to leave more material in the dark areas and less material in the light areas so the light can come through and really give the lithophane a good effect. So what we're going to have to do is look at the combine mode for the model here. So let's just go back to the view here. We can go to the components tree over here and we can look at changing the combine mode. So there's a couple ways we can do this. We can right mouse click on the actual model here and go combine mode subtract. We can actually do it in the 3D view as well. So if we click on our model and click this menu just here, we can go to the uh, combine mode so we can choose subtract here uh, we could choose merge etc so currently you set to add we want to start to subtract so let's click on subtract and you'll notice what it's done is it's fixed it by changing some of the dark areas to white and the white areas to black so you can see how already that has made a difference on our job here and you can see how the raised bits are now the dark areas that we had before and now the lighter areas have been pushed back so that's much much better now you may notice on the 3D view here, we've got this kind of translucent looking rectangle uh, around our model here. And that's actually our modeling plane. And that's just a reference point for us to build models on. And currently our model is below that. So that's why you see this hazy look over uh, Charlie here on our 3D view. But any component that touches the modeling plane is actually going to be shown in a darker color. You can see here there's some darker areas of red. 
and that's where the actual component is touching the modeling plane. So that's where it's actually meeting with the modeling plane in this case. Now this may be a little bit confusing. So if I come to view here and I go to draw modeling plane and I turn it off, you can see that's what the model actually looks like. But if I just go to the top view again and turn back on our modeling plane, this can actually be quite useful. And the reason it's useful is because it allows you to see uh, any models underneath a modeling plane. So for example, if you're making a dish, and there's a good example of this in our dish recess guide, where you have a model within your dish, a modeling plane can be great because it can show you where parts of the model are coming through the modeling plane that can lead to flat spots. So for that purpose, having the modeling plane on is actually a great idea. But right now we know that this is either sharing the modeling plane or underneath it. So we can go ahead and turn that off. So let's go up to view and let's uncheck that option there. So now we're going to go over to the design tab because we're going to limit the machining for our design here because we've got empty space around Charlie. We don't want the machine to be cutting where it doesn't need to be. So let's limit the space it's going to be cutting in by using a rectangle. So let's go to draw a rectangle. The anchor will be in the middle. X is zero, Y is zero, square corner type, width of six inches, height of eight inches. And let's click create. And now what we can do, you can see here in a 2D and a 3D view where we can select our uh, rectangular vector, we can limit the machining to this vector so it doesn't have any wasted moves. Now speaking of machining, let's hop over to the toolpath menu. So let's click on this button here on the top left. And first things first, let's check our material setup. So let's click on set and check this out. So our thickness is 0.25 inches. We're going to change the XY datum to the bottom left. As you recall, I mentioned earlier, we're going to change that for toolpathing. And then we're going to have the ZRF material surface. Now, in regards to model position in material, so normally you'd have a gap above the model or you'd have the model somewhere in the middle here uh, like that. But in this case, we actually want a gap below the model. Now, to define that gap or minimum thickness, we need to have on our lithophane, this will actually be determined by the material that you're using and maybe that the color that you're using and how translucent it is and how well light can travel through it. So you have to change that to be what works for you. But for this case, I'm going to go for a gap below model of 0.04 in this case. So I'm happy with that. So let's set that. And for my rapid Z gap, I'm going to go for 0.25 because that's safe for my machine. And I highly recommend that you change these values to be safe and appropriate for your machine. But I ran some tests previously to make sure these are safe and sound for mine. So double check these before you move on to anything else. And let's click OK. Now we're actually going to be creating two different toolpaths. We're going to use a 3D roughing toolpath and a 3D finishing toolpath. So let's look at the 3D roughing first, shall we? So let's go to the 3D roughing toolpath. And we're going to use a bore nose tool here, but I'm actually going to edit the settings for the tool. Now, if I click the edit button here, this will only edit the settings for the tool for this particular toolpath, not permanently across the tool. So I'm going to change some of the values here. So I'm going to change this one to 0.0625 for the pass depth. I'm going to change the step over to 0.05 don't need the extra zero there. And I'm going to change the spindle speed to 12,000 in this case. Now you'll notice that because I'm using a, an eighth inch ball nose, you're probably thinking, well, you usually use that for a finished pass, but in this case, we're going to use it for a roughing pass. And if we use a really strong step over, then it, what will happen is it will leave behind some ridges for our finishing toolpath. And that will be cleaned up by that finishing toolpath. So that looks all good. I'm going to click OK for these settings. Now for the machining limit boundary, we've gone for selected vector, and we're going to use this vector here, the rectangle that we made a minute ago, you can see it's selected because it has a dashed pink line. So it's going to limit the machining to that area only. Don't need a boundary offset, but I am going to leave some machining allowance because I want to leave a little bit of material behind for the finishing toolpath to clear up. As for the roughing strategy, I'm leaving it to Z level and I'll make sure this profile lasts, order level by level. Don't need raster angle in this case or ramp plunge moves, but I will we'll rename this to 3D roughing 0.125 BEM, which stands for Borno's end mill and I'll click calculate so we can have a look at this. Now you notice I get a warning and the warning saying that you've got a large machining allowance. The allowance left on, on is greater than 20% of the tool diameter. Now in this case, if you recall earlier, I manually changed the tool settings to have a larger step over of 40%. So in this case, I know uh, that I want that larger step over so I can ignore this safely. But this is here to give you a warning in case you've accidentally set a large step over you didn't mean to, uh, which can result to tool breakages. So you want to be aware of that. But I'm going to click OK so we can calculate the toolpath and we can have a look at what this is going to look like. So let's have a look at previewing this toolpath. So let's click on Preview Select the Toolpath with our toolpath selected. And you notice that we've got some of the areas cut away there, but there's still plenty of material for the finishing toolpath to cut away as well. And we've got the ridges there. That's from our step over. 
but we'll clean that up in just a moment with our finishing toolpath. Speaking of, let's go back to the top view, close this down, and let's come up to our 3D finishing toolpath. So you can see here I'm using the Borno's 8th uh, inch end mill again. I'm going to edit the settings again though, and I'm going to change the step over down to 8%, so 0.01, because I really want to find finish on this one. Happy with that, so let's click OK. I'm going to use the selected vectors as our machining boundary again, so we'll limit the machining to that boundary there. And I'm not going to use a boundary offset, but this time I'm actually going to use a raster. Now, because this is Corian, if there's any kind of tool marks left behind, it's going to be harsh to remove. So I want the tool mask to look uh, deliberate. So instead of going back and forth or up or down, I'm actually going to add a raster angle of 45 degrees. That way the marks will go this way. And it'll add some interesting marks to the background, which I think will give it a kind of nice effect. So let's put in a raster angle of 45 in here. And we'll rename this one to be 0.125 BEM for Borno's end mill. And we'll click Calculate. So you can see here the software is just calculating this toolpath now. And you can see how much of a finer toolpath we've got is going all over that material as opposed to earlier where we were having the uh, roughing only go to certain areas of the material. So let's have a look at the preview, shall we? So let's click on Preview Selected Toolpath with our finishing selected. And you can see that 45 degree raster angle there and it's cleaning that up really nicely. You're getting a lot of the detail out of that as it's going through and cutting through. We can actually dynamically look at the view while it's cutting. So you can see the actual toolpath in action there as well. OK, so that looks really good. Let's pop down on the top view again. On the 3D view here, it's actually hard to visualize what this is going to look like with a light shining behind it uh, because the preview doesn't work like that. But what we do have is a setting up here to check for lithophane. Now, if we click on this, it's going to end up simulating what it would look like if we actually put a light source behind the lithophane and shine a light through. Now it's only simulation, but it could give you a good idea of what it could look like in the end. So let's turn that on and let's have a look at what that may look like. So I'm just going to adjust the slider just a little bit. I want to go down to about there and I'm actually quite happy with that. I think that uh, is a really nice representation of our original image. Now if I just zoom in onto a 3D view here, you can see that the image is a little bit soft uh, and it's not as clearly defined as maybe we would like depending on the end use of the lithophane. So the detail could be a bit more fine on this, but the problem with that is it may take a lot of time to cut if we use a smaller tool, for example. So if we can minimize the time on the machine, the better, but that'll be up to you to decide uh, whether you want to spend the extra time on machining that. But right now, with the size of the cut that we have, this is about the best detail that we're going to get. But let's say we wanted to get a little bit more detail. Uh, let's just go ahead and show you how to do that. So let's look straight back down on top of this. We're going to close out of our preview here and we're going to right mouse click our finishing toolpath, click on duplicate. So we have a duplicate of that toolpath. Let's left mouse click twice to get into that toolpath. We're going to remove this tool here and we're going to choose a smaller tool, which is a 16th inch ball nose over here. Click on select. I'm just going to double check the step over for this one. 8% is where I want it, so that's all good. Again, we're going to leave these settings as they were. The raster is going to be 45 again. Let's click on calculate after renaming this one actually to the appropriate size of the tool. So there we are and let's click on calculate. And now what you're going to see is a much finer result here. So you can see that the toolpath has encompassed the majority of that space there in a much more densely packed toolpath because it's a smaller tool. We're going to slow down our preview just a little bit with the slider here so you can see what's going on. It's going to right mouse click while holding uh, control on the keyboard to drag it into view like that. And I'm just going to zoom in and right mouse click and drag so you can see some of the detail popping out on the preview. Let's click on preview select the toolpath. And what you'll see is it starts to clear up from the bottom right there as it's going on that 45 degree angle. And it's clearing up some of the details on the on the jacket there. If you keep an eye on some of the squares in the pocket on the uh, waistcoat, for example, in a minute, you see they get a little bit sharper as well. So you can see that tool really getting in there and creating some more uh, definition on the lithophane. So let's just speed that up. And there you can see, because it's a smaller tool, it gets much more fine detail. So it's able to get in there where the larger tool was not to create a much finer looking result. 
So we can see here as, as it's finishing up, it's creating all the detail there. And now that looks much better. We've got a much cleaner result by adding in an extra tool. Now, obviously, because I chose the 16th inch ball nose with some very basic mass, it should take about twice as long, but that's the sacrifice you have to, uh, for using a much smaller tool, uh, that it takes a little bit longer of your machining time. Now that's a balance that you can decide on yourself, whether you wanna spend the extra time on machining it, or if you have the extra time, to machine it for, to the extra level of detail. But I thought it'd be good to demonstrate that sort of detail you can get by sacrificing some of the machining time here so that you can create a much more uh, fine looking project. So at this stage, you can close up the preview. We can look at saving out our tool pass. Uh, but to do that, I'll refer you to the Safe Tool Pass Guide, which is one of our related videos. But we can save off this file so we can use it later. So let's go up to File, Save As, and then we can call this one Lithophane creation tool pass and now we've got this file ready to go for later so we can make edits to it or reopen it and cut it again if we want to but for now that concludes our tutorial on how to create a lithophane and you can see how it's a great way to show off how you can use the software to create some really interesting final results and there's nothing more exciting than creating one of these for friends and family. So if you've got some photos, maybe of holiday destinations, that you might be able to use those as a lithophane uh, to make some really interesting gifts. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.